There are currently more than 6,000 people living in abhorrent warehouse systems of direct provision in Ireland. My name is Ola. I have four children. More than 2,000 children have grown up in direct provision. They don't get proper food and clothes. Every day they are taking the same sandwiches into school for lunch. They are living their life as if they are in prison. I stay in Tushan Kasu Mystery. Am I asylum? I go in on Wednesday afternoons to Glen Vera. Um, I've been to some of the coffee mornings in Ashbourne House. The major problem with the, the direct provision centres is that people don't know how long they're going to be there. And some people have been there for a long, long time. Asylum seekers are receiving social welfare allowance of €38.80 a week for adults and €29.80 for children. They qualify, though don't always get a clothing allowance of up to €150 Euro every six months for an adult, which works out to be a maximum of €25 Euro per week. The state pays for the asylum seekers' bed and board in dedicated hostels around the country under a system called direct provision. Count the number of beds in that tiny space. Ten people in a room and one toilet. The owner pockets more than €11,000 per month for this small room. My name's Julie O'Leary and I'm the legal service manager here at NASC. And NASC is the Irish word for link. So our goal is to link asylum seekers, migrants and refugees to their rights all through their time in Ireland. So when they initially arrive, when you're living here and waiting for your application to be processed and after your application is processed and a decision is made on your case. Actually, I'm chef. When I saw my mom's cooking, then uh, I like cooking. When I was a child, I started my cooking. When I first came to Ireland, me and my children, we are sharing a room with four children. There were many people who were in, living in the system for five years, six years. There were many people at that time when this permission came. So they, are, they were still unable, like they were doing nothing. They were the most rightful, um, uh, like you can say, people to access the labor market permission, but they were not allowed to work in the labor market. And uh, the people who are coming new, new recently, now they, they can, yeah, yeah. They, they can get the work permission now because uh, and they, when they apply and they haven't received their first decision in nine months, then they can apply and they're eligible. So yeah. this was very discriminatory from the very start. And I still think this, uh, this is discriminatory because uh, even on labor permission, you are restricted. You, you are not allowed to drive your own car. You are not allowed to have your own license. I didn't do nothing. So Just I'm doing voluntary work. Um, I don't feel like it's a, um, another country. I'm living is like my family here. You know, Irish people are so nice. Upstairs, and they are very, very lively. So I'll, I'll be as quick as I can. And um, this is a fantastic project, and uh, I'd like to congratulate the Cork Migrant Centre, but all the all the groups and individuals who were involved in, in this project, because it's about empowering people, it's about engaging people, it's about building up confidence, and most importantly. We learn from each other, and people who have been through these experiences uh, before are the best people to pass that information on and to help other people as we go on. So that peer-to-peer -peer learning process um, is, is, is fantastic. I think it's a fantastic initiative. Um, and also, by bringing all the different groups right throughout Cork together, um, which doesn't happen very often, I think so that gives people a chance to, to network and build up that uh, and, and support um, as well. 
And um, I was upstairs before here, and this is the future. Here, the future of Ireland. Here, the future for Cork. Here. So it is great that she have come together and that she are uh, uh, being empowered most because the skills that she have and the skills that she will develop in the future are, 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 are beneficial to all, all of us um, as a society. Um, so in particular, I'd like to thank um, Ingrid, uh, Samara, Precious, uh, Justina and Deborah for all their achievements and what they have done. In Glenvira, uh, we're more involved in connecting with the residents to find out what their needs are. Uh, we're currently about to have a needs assessment. Um, but generally, we, we advertise the fact that we're going to be there on Wednesday afternoons and people come and they just ask whatever questions they have to ask and we connect them in with the services. Um, we also get some services in, so we've had uh, a woman in from the local employment services and, and a man in from the education training board and they've talked to people about their education and training opportunities and that's been really successful. So people are fully informed from people who have the expertise around education and training, that's, that's been really, really good. I have published a book. Uh, it's, uh, it's called Umendoso. It's, is it like it's, African? It's an Afri yes, it's in my African Ask language. It's marriage mysteries. Oh, okay. It speaks about uh, an African woman in a marriage because marriage in Africa and marriage here is totally different. Like I should say, I generalize and say, uh, and say African marriage because the African culture is, it, it interlinks, it's almost the same because I, 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 I realized, after coming here, I realized that we, it's almost the same. So being married as an African woman, it's kind of a sacred thing. It's very important that you get married as an African woman. So my name is Rory O'Neill. I work for the Irish Refugee Council. I am the integration project manager. So my role is primarily working with people that are coming out of the asylum process and trying to access housing, education, employment. Yes, I have feel, I got feel back, but they told me they are taking me back to my country. In 2016, a boy of six years old had been playing with his friends in Kinsale Road Direct Provision Centre in Cork. He was knocking on his room and expecting his mom to open. There was no answer, so he asked security to open. They found his mom dead. She had hanged herself in the room. She wasn't the first or the last person to die through suicide in direct provision. Talking about deportation or decisions on cases is that people get legal advice on their case as soon as they possibly can. And sometimes that's a problem because solicitors are very busy or you can't get to a solicitor very early on in your case. But it's really important that people either go to the legal aid board and access a solicitor or they come to an organisation like NASC or other organisations like us around in the country. We have four key demands. One, obviously an end to deportation. Two, uh, the ending of the direct provision system. And three and four would be full access to the labour market for all people seeking asylum and access to third level education. So they would be off our, our key demands. It is better to commit suicide, like Mita, Mita committed suicide. She tried to commit suicide. So don't force us. Hey,